Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift and blessing of community, especially the community of the body of Christ here at Ascension Lutheran Church. We're so overjoyed that many of our brothers and sisters were able to join us live in worship for the first time today. And we pray that you continue to watch over that transition back to our in-person activities, that we do it with wisdom and safety, but also with the joy that can only come from being together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now I ask your blessing upon our Bible study, that as we look at the Eighth Commandment and we learn about the value of reputation and words and how we ought to treat one another um, with those as you intend, help deepen our understanding of these things by our uh, good looking for the knowledge of those things in your word. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Oh, hey. All right. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of nice. Uh, people just handing me stuff. I can get used to that. <laughs> All right. And I'm taking attendance. If you're here, please raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> it makes jokes, too. All right, here we go. All right, so if you want to get a head start, open up your catechisms to page 110. Um, this is another one of those commandments that is, I mean, we hit the hard ones, like all right through there, four, five, and six. And I said last week, right, I'm not really competing with the world being where somebody's advocating that stealing is a good idea. And we're still really not to the point where people are advocating that being able to lie about yourself and others is a good idea. So, yeah, have, have no fear, you know, our, our original sin nature, you know, might lead us there eventually. And we shouldn't necessarily be surprised about that. All right. So what is the Eighth Commandment? Uh, let's see here. Who should I pick on today? Um, Ron. What is the Eighth Commandment? Let me see. Uh, I remember you shall not give false testimony against you. Hey, you were looking at your book. No, I'm, just I'm just kidding. That's the point of the book. That's why I bought it for you, so you can read it. All right. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What's false testimony, Sally? Ron is just the greatest guy. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> you, what did you say? Lying. lying. Yeah, Mike wanted to provide us an active example of that. Um, yeah, false testimony is lying about someone, right? So if you're giving a testimony about something, you're bearing witness to it. And if you're being false in your witness, right, you're telling an untruth about something. So that's that's technically like a court of law legal term. So. Uh, when you're talking about giving a testimony, um, usually you think either in the court of law or like a faith testimony. Um, and in both cases, it would be bad to bear a false testimony. All right. All right. So what does this mean? What, how does Luther expand this for us? He says, we should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him and explain everything in the kindest way. Okay. All right. Bible study's done. <laughs> Straightforward, right? This is another one of those things in the Christian faith where reading in the book, you get done reading it, you're like, yep, totally agree with that. And then what happens 10 minutes later? <laughs> you lie, <laughs> right? Or you find yourself in a situation where you really, 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 really don't want to tell the truth. It might be really convenient for you, or it might be very convenient for somebody you don't like, and then all of a sudden, the Eighth Commandment pops into your head, and you're like, <laughs> rumbling about doing good. All right, we re remember we talked about the commandments. There's two, two aspects to every commandment. There's the, prohibit the prohibitive aspect of the commandment, the things you're not supposed to do in order to keep it. And then there's also the... Huh? Proactive. The proactive aspect, right? Where the things that you are to do in order to honor the commandments. And Luther lays those out pretty nicely. So we're going to go through those today. So number two on your outline, how do we fear and love God in keeping the eighth commandments? And this is the section of prohibitive behavior by not speaking. And if you're in your catechism, this is question number 84 on the bottom of page 110. So we fear and love God by not speaking about others in ways that harm them. Harmful speech includes A, 
telling lies about our neighbors in everyday life or in a court of law. Very good. Right? So there, why would we make that distinction? That it's, it's wrong in both places. That's lying no matter where it is, right? But we get that. So why do we have to point that out specifically? Well, because we don't spend most of our time in the court of law. Well, most of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, close. Yeah. I was going to say um, one almost seems more curious than the other. Like okay. Lying in everyday life, maybe that doesn't seem very. According to whom? According to us and our humanity. Yeah, according to the world, one of those things is actually <laughs> prosecutable and illegal. So if you're on the stand in a court of law and you lie, what's that called? Perjury. Perjury, right? You perjured yourself and there are consequences for that. What happens if you get caught in a lie with a friend? Yeah. You might lose a friend. You might lose a friend, but nobody's going to throw you in jail or give you a fine, right? So what we're establishing here is that like the world, the understanding is not exactly the same as ours, right? So from our perspective, is there a difference between those two situations, spiritually speaking? None. None. Right. They're both lies. They're both sins, and therefore they both bar you from having a right relationship with God. All right, very good. We're going to look at the Matthew 26 passage there in your catechism. Uh, let's see. Pete, can you read that for us? I believe I can. It says, now the chief. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at least two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. All right. So we, we went over that in one of the Wednesday services, if you were there, the return from false witness, right? and we talked about how. They really couldn't find much on Jesus, so they had to make stuff up. That's an example of a false testimony. All right, letter B. Betraying our neighbors by making blank their blank faults or secrets. By making, what's the first blank? Public. Public. By making public their blank faults or secrets. Private faults or secrets. So this is a really bad quality for a pastor to have. Because then what will no one do? They won't trust me and they won't tell me anything that I really ought to know as their pastor. Because I'm not being a good job, not doing a good job of being their pastor. Right? So when somebody says something to you and says, please keep this between us. And then you go out and don't do that. Even if it's accidental, what are you breaking? They come in. Right? And it's important to acknowledge it, even if it's accidental, right? Because if it's accidental and somebody gets mad at you, what's the temptation then? Retribution. Do to likewise about you. Okay, so they might be tempted to do the same thing to you, because supposedly if they trust you enough to share something private, you probably shared some private things with them. But what what is the temptation for you? Excuse. Make an excuse, right? You're gonna get defensive because like, well, I didn't do it on purpose, it's not like I meant to. And then pretending like it still wasn't a sin, right? And believe me, I'm right there with you. I would be tempted to do the same thing, and I often have, right? Uh, but it's important to know that even if it's accidental, it's still a violation of the eighth command and one we need to repent of. Yeah, a super easy way to do it is oftentimes in Christian circles, it'll be offered up as uh, part of a prayer. But you know, like you're praying for them, but in reality, you're just telling the folks around you what you want to tell them. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, so um, this could be a you could violate this accidentally with good intentions in the context of prayer, or intentionally, or intentionally. <laughs> but that's it. So one of the things, if you send a prayer request to the office, you know, we usually ask in return. Does the person know? Huh? Does the person know you're doing that? No, we say, do we have permission to share it? Because they may just want me to know, or they may just want Barb to tell me. 
And if they are willing to share with the congregation, it's an excellent opportunity for us to be the body of Christ to one another. Right? And so, and even when I'm visiting somebody, if they tell me about something in the visit, I will usually ask, do you mind if I share that with the congregation? And they may say no, which is fine, or they may say, just keep it general. So maybe they don't want people to know the details of the surgery they're having, but they would like their family at church to know that I'm having a surgery. Right? So, yeah, so great, great point. Proverbs 11, 13, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. Right? And that is an extremely essential point to keep if you want the body of Christ to function in the proper sense. Because that builds trust. And you have to have trust in order to share one another's burdens and joys, which is what we're supposed to be doing with one another. Now that's different from encouraging. You may have a situation where somebody shares something with you that's private, and it may be the appropriate action to encourage them to share it with either the person that may be the subject of your conversation, right? So maybe they're upset with somebody in their life, and you may want to encourage them, I think you need to talk to this person, right? That may be an appropriate thing, but it's not a decision you can make for them, right? Because imagine if you do that, and neither person is ready to talk or doesn't want to, it's not going to work out anyways. And you just triangulated yourself, and now both people don't like you, right? And in a long-term sense, too, you basically cut yourself out of the ability to hear those people and offer advice, which you don't want. All right, letter C. Slandering our neighbors by rushing to blank. Judgment. Very good, judgment. Blanking about them or spreading blank. <laughs> Complaining about them awesome. is the second one. And what's the last one? Rumors. Spreading rumors. Yeah. So this is the gossip one. So what does slander mean? We don't really use that word very often anymore. What does slander mean? They're, they're running somebody down, but they're not there to defend themselves. Okay. Right. So you're slandering somebody by running them down when they're not there to defend themselves. And there's usually another aspect to it as well. False. It's false, false, right? So the thing you're telling about them is false, okay? Um, you're still violating the Eighth Commandment, by the way, if you're speaking poorly about them, even if it isn't truth. But we'll get to that, that's not, that's not slander. All right, what about what, like, which one of these three do you think is probably the easiest to do? Easiest to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spreading rumors is yours? All right. Why is that easy? Because you, you hear some goosey, juicy gossip. You want to spread it to somebody. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, you hear some news that you're like, oh, I know a lot of people don't know this. Your darn sinful nature immediately is like, you're just, you have to... Like you, it's automatic that you have to resist sharing that with others, right? And it's even worse typically if you know you're probably not supposed to, right? Run it. Rushing to judgment. Rushing to judgment. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a subconscious thing that happens, rushing to judgment, right? Now, um, judgment is a, is a tricky word in our culture. Because what, is all judgment bad judgment? No. What can somebody give me an example of a good judgment? You leave somebody and you say, "I like that person." <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think they're too good. <laughs> okay, so judgment can be a positive thing. You can judge someone in a positive way and say, "Oh, this is a good person. They're trustworthy." Right. If you witness another Christian brother or sister doing something and you bring it to their attention. Yeah, so right, Paul gives us plenty of examples in the New Testament of one of the good forms of judgment among the Christian communities. If you see a brother or sister erring away from Christ, then we're called to point them back to Christ, which usually involves judgment on a behavior. Right? Because what takes us away from Jesus? Sin, right? What's another one? 
It's kind of hard to come up with good judgments, isn't it? <laughs> We're still used to talking about judgment in a negative sense. What about somebody killed somebody and they're in a court of law and they're judged to be guilty and penalized for the action that they committed? Is that a good judgment or a bad judgment? It's a, good judgment. It's a good judgment. Right. Yeah. And what does the Bible say about the authority wielded in that context? Where does it come from? It comes from God. Right. Now, give me an example of bad judgment. Saying he's guilty before you hear heard all the evidence. Okay, yeah. <laughs> making making an accusation and presuming a conclusion before hearing any sort of evidence, right? What else? It's assuming the worst of people, right? Which happens so easily, right? Yeah. If we see somebody from afar, there's something that we witness, or and we just assume, oh, well, that's because they, you know, did this. Okay, so assuming intention. Now, can that be a sin just in the negative sense, or what if you assume positively? Can that be a sin? Uh, a, a case where you know making a judgment in a, in a positive nature would be uh, if you have a, a Christian brother whom you know is sinning, and they don't want to be, you know, be violating God, and you 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 know you bring exhortation in front of them. It's necessary, and it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah, Matthew 18. I think and the judgment right. is where we group all people together, like a specific race or okay. ethnicity, and you judge all of them, everyone based on. Sure. Um, so judging by an immutable characteristic, right? Which, like, that in and of itself is wrong. Because it's judging by a standard which God does not allow for, right? And and that's our determiner there. So it is. So I wanted to make that 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 root distinguishing point because culturally speaking, a lot of people who say it's wrong to be racist have no basis for why it's wrong. It's just as like a politeness or a niceness or a civilized society reason, and we have a much deeper reason because God said you don't judge like that, right? And that the picture given of Re in Revelation of, of the kingdom of heaven is, is a people of every race and every nation. Right? And so we're instructed not to do that. Right? That's in direct violation of the way God wants us to live. Right? So we have a deep and abiding reason to be against those sorts of things. Because you'll notice that racism has sort of morphed in our country a bit, especially in the last four or five years. And the reason it's morphing is because it's not, the way our culture uses it is not really tied to a root reason. And so when something's not tied to a root reason, it becomes something that you can shift over time to suit your needs. Okay. Now it also bears mentioning that that doesn't mean that that evil no longer exists. In fact, we start encountering the opposite problem and that now it has much more rain than it did before because the whole topic has been confused. And so it becomes harder to see the real thing. Yeah. But it's important for us to always recognize that because, because we do have a root cause and reason for why that's bad. Right? And that's against God's will. So that's very good. It's bad judgment. Yeah. Piggybacking on Rob's, um, a positive judgment that would actually be a bad one. Um, let's say several people have a mountain of evidence that somebody in your church is doing something wrong and they, they bring it before before him and other people go, oh, no, no, no. That's Jack. He's a pillar of the community. There's no way that's right. Very good. Even though they have all this evidence, that can't be. You're wrong. Right. Because um, right, that's doing the same thing that Cooper was talking about, right? You're assuming intention without, without having any evidence or knowledge of it. Right. And whether you're assuming positively or negatively, it could both end up being a violation of the Eighth Commandment. <clears throat> Because you're not only bearing false testimony if you're doing it knowingly, you're also bearing false testimony if you do, if you assert something that you don't know for sure, as if you are. Right? There's no way this person would do X. If you don't know that, and really, given our doctrine of original sin, you shouldn't be making absolute statements like that about other people. Then that would be bearing false witness. Right? You're referring to something that you don't know is true or is or very, very well could be untrue, right? Yeah, Russ. This amendment is so hard for me in part because if you define it as simply the act of 
the slanderous word. You might be tempted to say, ooh, I, I refrain from sharing that bit of juicy gossip. But I guess if I think through in my mind, just basically what I what I perceive, particularly like if you're online and there's or just people that you know you disagree with, and you know, and I know in my heart or in my mind that I don't give them the best, I don't put the best construction on things. I have habits of just assuming the worst, particularly if you know if you've had discord with someone before. I just anticipate it. So if you take that to the next level of not just refraining from saying something that is false testimony, but also just sort of the the mental habits, well, the spiritual habits, right? Yeah. Not just mental. It's it's your heart that your heart thinks bad things about others. It's it's. It's overwhelming. It's right. just overwhelming. Yeah. And I, I think that's what Ronette was getting at. It's almost like an, an automatic internal heart thing that like like to Ron's point when he mentioned that before in regards to the sixth amendment. Like it's not like I can sit there and meditate for three hours and turn it off for a day. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, Dave, yeah, I'm gonna say it's sort of like the a boy who cried wolf syndrome. Mm -hmm. It's hard, it's hard to uh, not you shouldn't assume. But if you have somebody who's always complaining a certain way, and every time it's unjustified, when you look into it deeper, it's very hard to back away and say, well, maybe they're right this time. Right. Yeah. I, actually, one of my favorite TV shows is called Psych. Um, and there's an episode in there where there's a guy who's known for being a, the town liar. And he comes forward to the police and says that he witnesses a crime. And everyone immediately just assumes he's lying again and they don't even give him the time of day except for the main character of the show because he finds something credible in the way he relates his witness statement, right? And so in one case, everybody's judging the individual and not the situation. And, and for one person, they're judging the situation and the evidence, right? Uh, Pete. However, prejudging is sometimes um, the word I'm looking for self uh, preservation. You walk down a dark alley and you see a figure coming to you with a certain type of walk, with a certain type of swagger, dressed a certain way. You don't know if that person's going to do you harm. Might be the nicest guy in the world. Right. But what's happening in your heart at that moment? You know, you're fearful because of other things that you've seen in the world. Sure. Um, so that, so that, like the 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 example Pete's giving is a judgment could be out of self preservation, right? Um, and even in your example of somebody walking down the dark alley, you you've already made a judgment at that point. Of maybe or maybe I should or shouldn't even go in the dark alley, right? Because you've made a judgment that like that looks less safe than staying on the sidewalk, even though this is going to take me a little bit longer to get where I want to go, right? So judgment, or I like to say discernment because it doesn't say that has the same negative connotation, is an everyday aspect of our lives, right? And so, because I've seen times where people try to make the argument that like any sort of judgment is always bad judgment. And when they make that statement, they're doing what Cooper pointed out, right? They're assuming intention without having any knowledge of it, right? Um, it could be that the person in question is not going to go in the dark alley or is nervous regardless of what the person looks like because they they were a victim of a mugging in a dark alley right and it has nothing to do with the particularities of the individual right it's just the situation brings back memories of a traumatic experience yeah mike so many things to talk about on this yeah but I, I think this is a in particular an opportunity for us to witness in in the world, right, and in, in our communities, especially if you work, you know, it, we talk a lot about teamwork in my office, and this is one in particular that lends itself to an opportunity for a Christian to witness in a lot of different ways into a workplace and, and work relationships and bring a lot of faith principles without necessarily quoting the Bible after every sentence. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to do that. And I just, I just had an opportunity to do that recently with my staff. And what I like to do with this, this in particular, is to flip it a little bit and personalize it, right? Because we can talk about this as a command. This is what you're not supposed to do. And we do talk about people's reputation. But what I like to 
the way I like to understand this is that what you're doing whenever you are critical of somebody or you're not putting the best possible construction on them, you're actually taking something away from them, right? Everybody is imbued with the dignity that the Lord gives to each and every one of us. And whenever you are unkind to somebody you, you, or you disparage them or you, you spread false rumors about them, things of that nature, you are taking that dignity away from them. Something that the Lord has given to them, you are taking something that the Lord gave to them away from them. You're also giving away your own dignity by engaging in that type of conduct. Right. And I think in that way, it really personalizes it and it makes it much more relational because this is a relational, this is a relational command, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, there are relational in one way or the other, but this is very relational. And so if you think about it, I, when I speak these words, I'm taking something away from this person. I think it, at least for me anyway, it makes it a little bit more visceral, right? A little bit yeah. more real, yeah. you know? No, I think that's a great point. Um, yeah. When you were making your comments, it made me think of, I took a seminary, I took a class on team ministry. So when you're working in a ministry with multiple people, and one of the things that really struck me just when I started getting the books for that class is a ton of the books in that class were written by non-Christian, or they were they were Christian, but the primary reason they were writing their book is they were a business consultant firm. And so there's an owner for a business consulting firm. And the overlap of biblical relationship principles in those books were like unreal, right? And we can even see it now too. Like we do have such an excellent opportunity, not even necessarily in the context of a specific business community, but just the community at large, because one of the things that's happening right now in our culture is a really vindictive nature to relationships. Where I'm going to go and I'm going to find something you said in the ignorance of your youth 17 years ago. And I'm going to use that as a reason to get you fired, right? If that goes on, how, how refreshing is it going to be for someone to interact with someone else that maybe you find that out about somebody and you don't do that? And they ask, why? You say, well, I've also done ignorant and sinful things and I've been forgiven by my Lord. So what? by what reason would I not forgive you or assume that you haven't changed, right? How powerful would that be for that person? I'm, I'm, I'm handling it. I'm handling a defamation claim right now, um, and it 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 needs to be settled, right? I mean, these cases need to be settled. There's there's no win for anybody whenever they litigate. And there's money there. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. And so, you know, I made an appeal to my opposing counsel to settle this case, and my appeal was all Christian principles. I didn't say it like that, sure. but I drew it completely out of. Christian principles, you know, right. this is the, there's a win-win here. Let me explain to you why your clients win, right? And it was all about reputation and healing the community and healing and all of those types of principles. And I explained it how, how my clients win, you know, this is what, and they're not trying to get over on your people, but both, everybody can find a way to heal. And, and if we can, if, if we can resolve this case, and it was all, it was all a, a, appeal to, Based in Christian principles, basically, is what it was. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and, and sort of to like bring that to the, the discussion we're having is like that's a natural meaning of the law that we're, we're hearing about in the Ten Commandments and the natural law written on the hearts of people. Right. Nobody likes to be slandered. Nobody likes to be betrayed or lied about. Like, ever, but no one has to tell you that that's bad. Right. That all, that's something automatic. Now, you may do it. For other reasons, for personal gain and other stuff like that, but nobody really um, like one of the objections to this is that there have been different moralities and cultures across the world, but there hasn't really been a substantive difference. If you wanted to imagine a substantive difference according to natural law, it would be a culture that exhorts and encourages cowardice and stealing and betrayal. But there's never been a culture where you're lauded for stealing from your neighbor or where you're lauded for betraying your closest relationships. Right? Nobody thinks that. And so you do have this opportunity to speak these principles. You don't even necessarily have to use Christian language in order to get the, the spirit of our, our relationships and our community across, right? Because it connects with that natural law. And we have the added benefit, like I made the point about racism, is we have a deep and abiding reason as to why we're doing that that many people do not have. 
right? For now, it's sort of still working because we're relying on the Judeo-Christian morality worldview that our culture was built on. But you can start to see that that's frayed, or you can start to see that people are making arguments that don't connect to basic things that most people believe are true, right? And it's because it's, for them, there's no deep and abiding objective root for why that's a behavior to be, to be uh, lauded versus curtailed, right? And we have those reasons and people are looking for those, right? Imagine just for a moment, it's hard to do it, but imagine if you didn't have those objective existential connections for your understanding of right and wrong. Like, it's just very difficult to imagine how you're going to find your way in the world because everything would be about power and self-gain. And it's not very satisfying. It, it, it's sort of empty. Right? Um, and so we have something that people in their creatureliness desperately desire. It's, it's wired into their created being. Right? And, it's, and it's evident by the fact that nobody thinks any of these sorts of things are good. They may use them as a convenience for their own gain, but they never think it's a good thing. No, Rob. An easy way to see this change in belief is how a vast uh, percentage of the population do not believe that there is a truth. Uh, you have your truth, I have my truth. There is no absolute truth. And, and, and that's ludicrous. <laughs> well, not only does, from our perspective, does that not make sense, but it has to borrow from something. So if, if you're saying, like, there's my truth and your truth, and there's no real truth with a capital T, you're still going to find yourself relying on the fact that most people are going to think something is good and something is bad. Right? We're just wired to work that way. You can't really get away from it. So you'll have somebody who says, well, it's your truth or my truth, but then they'll make an objective judgment about someone. Right? And then you have to say, well, if you're being intellectually honest, you can't even use those words anymore. Because moral words have no more meaning. All you can say is, I don't like that. Because you made truth subjective, so it's just your opinion versus the other person's opinion. All right, and this was, um, I wouldn't necessarily encourage reading Nietzsche. Um, <laughs> it's not for everyone. But this is the point that Nietzsche makes, right? Is if you get rid of God, you rip the roots out of the basis for any sort of morality. Right? And the result of that eventually will be that everything is only a will to power. So then all you're left with at your disposal is, I don't like this person. I don't like the thing they did. But that's just my opinion. It's not based on any standard that I'm sort of expecting everyone to behave. And so the, what's the only way that I can enact my will about this person's behavior is if I have power to do it. And so then the goal becomes accruing the power in order to enforce your will because there is no objective rule that everyone's supposed to follow. So I've got to try and form the world the way that I want. And then who becomes God? Me, right? And you can see that in the, in the conflicts that are happening in Western society, right? There are basically a bunch of conflicts between little gods that all want things their own way. Which is why when they say things, you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. And they say, I don't care. <laughs> because I'm the God of my own universe, so I can make the rules. So this just is, right? And I, and I want to point that out, not to harp on cultural issues, but I think it's helpful in understanding how to process what you hear people say, okay? Because what you're gonna, what you're coming, the, the frame of reference you're coming from is, you're assuming that there's objective truth and a reality that is what it is apart from the way you personally feel about it, right? Which we're talking about with the 10 commandments. Like in the eighth commandment, even when it would be super convenient for me to lie about somebody else, and maybe I get a million dollars, it's wrong. And it's wrong not because I, in my moral superiority, decided it was, but because I'm beholden to an objective reality that says so. Okay? A lot of the people you hear on TV, and a lot of the people that you hear in our culture, maybe among some of your close relationships, they don't think any of that is necessarily true. And so that's why they can state the things they can say with conviction. And to you, it doesn't seem to make any sense, right? Because they're starting from a totally different frame about what reality is. 
and reality essentially what it is is they define what reality is so basically when you're arguing with them semantics or or philosophy or whatever you're arguing with the god of his own universe which isn't very effective yeah an argument like that is cool <laughs> it is and so what must the goal become for the christian in that context as mike is pointing out is not pointing out the legalism of our faith but bearing forth the spirit of the gospel so my dad had a phrase that has always stuck with me that is the the law of god has never changed the hearts of man only the gospel does that so if you're coming at somebody who assumes a totally different reality from you there's no reason that we should expect them to listen to god's law they don't believe he exists and in their mind whether they understand it or not they are God. They make the rules. Right? That's essentially what you're saying when you say, I have my truth and you have yours. So the only way that they're going to get their minds changed is through the power of the Holy Spirit by bearing witness to the gospel. And so don't get drawn into the, the legalistic arguments about semantics and things like that. Right? We'll leave that to the people in the courts of law that are defending our liberties. But we're also not placing our hope in that either. Right? Our hope is in Christ. So the Bible says that the gates of hell can't triumph over the church. A crappy human society is not going to either. Pete. You, you said a couple of things which uh, struck with me. You, you, you used the term creatureliness, and then you were talking about um, nature. Sorry, I called you a creature. <laughs> no, thank you. I am. I was created. And, um, and you were talking about Nietzsche ripping God out of the equation. Yeah. And we... And you're talking about how you, you know when you start arguing with people who don't believe in a god, you're basically arguing with who they think is a god, who is themselves. And there's a there's a subtlety in ripping God out of the equation uh, in our culture. Find a textbook nowadays that actually uses the word creature. You won't find it. Um, so there are little things like that 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 when our parents were raised up. You might have had people who were not really practicing Christians, but the world used those moralities yeah. throughout. No. We're entering into a, an era where those moralities are not, not always there as they once were. And we need to realize as Christians that we're not dealing with people who may have been brought up with those ideals. Well, and, and to piggyback on that point, the, the great joy you have as a Christian is not that you live in a Christian earthly society. That's not your great joy. That's a privilege, right? Mm -hmm. And we're certainly not going to look a gift horse in the mouth that we've had such a great society to live in. Right? But the great joy and hope that you have as a Christian is that you your eyes have been opened to the truth of this world in Jesus. And that remains the same whether the culture you live in agrees with you or not. So one of the, one of the challenges that's gonna be facing the church in our, in our society, as it becomes more and more post-Christian, is being comfortable resting just in that joy and hope. Because it may be that we reach a point where that's the only one we've got, but it's the only one we need, okay? Um, and so, you know, it's hard for us to imagine, you know, and we had sort of a realization in one of our classes at the seminary about this. One guy was like, I've never really thought about the fact that I may have to meet in secret or somebody might throw a brick through my window because I'm a Christian, but it very well could be my future. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that because I'm hopeless about our, our system of government being able to, to stem the tide or anything like that, but I'm not putting my hope in that. It very, mel it very well may make a turn. And I'm hoping that it does, but I'm not placing my hope in that. Right? And so if we ended up having to meet in secret in somebody's basement, that's what we'll do. Because our eyes have been open to the truth of this world. And I'm not trading that for anything else. So yeah. when it comes to something like that, the faith of the believers will be even stronger 
more intense. Well, I think I mentioned in this class, you guys know where the church is growing the fastest, the two countries where it's growing the fastest, is, is Iran and Afghanistan. Two places where it's least accepted and violently opposed. Yeah, Ron. Uh, <clears throat> now, a lot of people who believe in God, they go to church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. But they have views, of course, <laughs> They may be the racist person there is. Yeah. Sure. They hate a certain group of people. And you talk to them, but they're, they're supposedly this great Christian person. But I mean, I know we all have things in us, sure. of course, because we're sinful. Yep. But I, I just really don't understand how they can say they believe in God or Jesus Christ, and but yet they feel a certain hatred towards people. Sure. Right. Or whatever it is, you know. I, that's really hard to deal with. It is very difficult to deal with. And that's the, the because it's very difficult to deal with is one of the reasons that it's it's allowed to be around. Because a lot of churches don't address it. A lot of pastors don't address it. Right? Or, they so, or they facilitate. Or they facilitate. <laughs> um, but like it, for example, if you came to me and we spoke about something and, and you had an unrepentant sin, whether it's racism or you have like a like an unjustified hatred. Of an individual because of one of the sins they struggle with, whatever it may be, whether it's racism or homosexuality or lying or whatever, like that's grounds for me to bar you from communion, which churches don't typically do, um, because you would be taking communion to your detriment because you are an unrepentant sinner, and communion is for repentance. So that's why I always make the distinction. The important distinction isn't the particular sin; it's the state of the heart. Regard with regards to that sin. So you could have somebody who's a homosexual and has given in to homosexual activities and behaviors, as long as their heart is one always viewing that as sin and as a mistake and coming back to Christ and confessing it as a sin, they're in heaven. Even if they do that their whole life, I mean, that's the radical nature of the gospel. And it has to be the radical nature of the gospel, as you rightly point out, because we all struggle with sin, and if it isn't, we're all screwed for different reasons, but we're all screwed. I mean, how many times have you confessed the certain sins you confessed this morning? Many times. Me too, right? And so then the sameness of the church service becomes an immense comfort to you because regardless of what happened between Monday and Saturday, what do you hear from Jesus? Your sins are forgiven. I love you, you are mine, right? And so... In order for that to be maintained, you do have to confront unrepentant sin. And not for your sake, not for your moral righteousness, right? But you're confronting it on behalf of that person. Your demonstration of Christian love for that person is, hey, I'm seeing something in your life that is leading you away from Christ and to destruction, which I don't want and I know he does not want. And so I'm going to point that out to you. And I'm going to ask you to repent. Is pointing something out to someone like that, is that me putting a judgment from me onto them? or If it's in accordance with the word of God, where's the judgment coming from? Is God. it coming from Ron or is it coming from God? God. It's coming from God. Yeah. And so you're not putting the judgment on them. They already have that judgment. You're making them aware of the already existing judgment. right? And the fact that that judgment already exists is the basis for your concern. You don't want them to be in judgment, right? You want them to be in grace. And so, and it's hard to maintain because it, the temptation is to come from your own righteousness sometimes. It's especially if that person is sinning against you. But the basis for your correction is always of compassion because you don't want them to be under judgment. Right? And you may have to repent of doing that incorrectly, as we often do. But those are the things where to really foster serious Christian community, you have to have the courage to do those sorts of things. And so one of, one of Luther's quotes that's regularly taken out of context is sin boldly. Um, and he said that not because you should go and do sin, but he said that because you shouldn't let the fear of possibly doing something wrong prevent you from doing something. And the point he's making is you should pray about it, should meditate on the scriptures and do the best you can to do what you're asked to do faithfully. And if you screw up, 
So maybe the conversation starts out great and somebody's response ticks you off and then it goes off the rails. Maybe you need to repent of that. That's okay. You live under grace, not under the law. Yeah. No, you don't go into that assuming that it's going to be okay. That's the wrong posture of the heart. Right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And it, it is it is a difficult task we're called to. Right? Okay. We're not even halfway down the first page. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are great. Okay. All right, now we're doing the um, proactive part. So we fear and love God by speaking constructively about others. This includes blank our neighbors when others speak bad of them. Defending our neighbors when others speak bad of them. Now, do you only do that when they're lying about your neighbors? All the time, right? So somebody could be telling something truthful about your neighbor, but they could be doing it in a way that isn't loving. And in that same instance, you said, look, man, like, I, I know what you're saying is true, but this isn't the place to say it. Because um, that, I mean, that goes back again to somebody told you in confidence and you share their dirty laundry with a group of people. You're not lying about what they said to you, but it's still wrong. Right? Okay. And the verse for that one is that Proverbs 1. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. I love that verse because it's talking about defending the rights of the poor and needy, but it also says judge righteously. We usually, in our culture, separate those two subjects entirely. But this is where the radical nature of the gospel and our understanding of love from the scriptures conflicts with culture. That things that we are going to do that we know, because our eyes have been opened to the truth of this world, are loving, may be, and often are, construed as unloving. Right? You may find yourself being called a bigot about something that you and your heart know you're not bigoted about. But that's what we're called to do. Letter B, drawing attention to our neighbor's blank qualities and deeds. Good. Good. How many times have you received a compliment and you're just sort of like, <laughs> not know what to do with yourself? Right? And, and it's way harder to get one than it is to complain about something new. Right? So it's important that we do that intentionally. And be grateful when you receive one. Luke 7, 4 to 5. The people of Capernaum spoke well of the centurion. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is one, the one who built us our synagogue. So exhort the good qualities of others. Letter C. Seeking to understand our neighbor's actions in the most blank light, and explaining them in the blank way possible. Positive is the first one. Kindness, Kindness is the last one. Now this one, that's hard. Because does it qualify when you should do that? <coughs> it does not. So even if you're in an ongoing feud with somebody at church, or you're harboring some, some bitterness about something with a particular person at work, or maybe in your extended family. You're still supposed to do this. You're still supposed to seek to understand in a positive light and explain them and their actions in the kindest way. But it's so tempting, it's so easy to get one over on them. When you're annoyed with them or frustrated with them. Right? But imagine the place that this could be. And we take this sort of thing for granted, by the way. But there are people who, if they come in here and they interact with us and something like this occurs, it's going to blow them away because they've never experienced it anywhere else. I mean, I've heard really incredible stories about. 
I had a young guy in my previous congregation grew up Catholic, started dating a Lutheran girl by the grace of God. <laughs> and she brought him to church because he wasn't really active by the time they met. And he said when he came to church, a Lutheran church, even though he grew up in the Catholic church, it was the first time he ever felt like he heard the gospel. And so I'm sitting there probably thinking, yes, 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 Jesus died on the cross, take for my sins. I've heard this message before. And he's over there basically like getting his world blown apart in a great way. Right? So don't underestimate the basic truths and realities of the Christian community. Because the stuff that you and I take for granted may be the very thing that somebody spent their whole life looking for. And you have no idea until they hear it. Right? And I think that's part of the opportunity Mike is talking about. We have an excellent opportunity to do that because people are looking for this stuff. Even if they don't necessarily know exactly what it is they're looking for, you can sort of feel that. Right? Like the, when, I, when I visited and I asked you why you stayed here at Ascension, most of your answers were the people, the community. And I would guess that the reason for your answer is when you got here, the community behaved in ways that you didn't experience elsewhere, that you were treated with grace that you weren't expected to be perfect. And when you weren't perfect publicly, you weren't humiliated for it. You know, people are searching for those things and we have the opportunity to bring it to them, to provide it for them. <clears throat> All right. And then um, open up your Bibles, Acts chapter five. We're gonna look at the story real quick. If you don't have a Bible, Get one on your phone or just listen along. Don't worry, we'll read it for you. We're starting at verse 33, 39. All right, starting at verse 40, 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them, but a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel. So the context of this is, this is the establishment religious leaders in Jerusalem when they're hearing about these new Christians and the preaching that they're going on. And I think this is in reference to the apostles. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put them in outside for a little while. And when he said to them, men of Israel, take care of what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodius rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. So chalk up one positive note for the Pharisees, by the way. Usually, they're usually the whipping boys, but he's right. Right? And what happened? They didn't disperse and scatter when the leader of the movement was killed. Right? They grew exponentially. So there he's demonstrating that here is the eighth man, putting the best construction. This could be from God. So your choice is pretty obvious, right? If you're not going to be able to stop it, even if you want to, if it's from God, then you may even find yourself opposing him. So let it play out. Okay, now we're just going to page 112. What are some of the ways people's reputations are damaged or destroyed in our society? Gossip, yeah. So telling something either private, publicly, that's not meant to be told publicly. What else? False accusations. False accusations, right? Right, and we've seen that even if the person ends up proved in a court of law to be innocent, 
What's happened already? Can't Damage is done. Can't put that back in the no. Back in the box. You can't put it back in the box. And unfortunately, with our social media, we're able to gossip at a rate that we never thought yeah. possible before. Yeah, right. With social media, gossip is rampant. It's also unwise in a lot of ways to participate in it, just because you're essentially providing an opportunity to have a written public ledger for all of your thoughts. But from a Christian perspective, it's like your worst nightmare. I mean, every time I've asked somebody if it was able to be like broadcasted on your forehead, all the thoughts you're thinking throughout the day, would you want that? They say no, but then they participate in Twitter, which is essentially the same thing. Right? So one of the things we're seeing right now is if you posted something online from 12 years ago, either out of ignorance or because at the time, it was an acceptable joke or whatever, and it no longer is, they find that and they use that, and you get fired from your job. And not just fired from your job, but your reputation takes a hit, and it's probably really difficult to find a job. I read an article, I'll get you now. I read an article that was really interesting because I had met some South Africans when I lived in Germany, and they have a very different culture, an interesting culture in South Africa. And so I was watching some of their comedians and their jokes, they have a lot of jokes that would not fly here. Okay? And so there was a woman from South Africa who worked for an advertising company, and she posted a joke on Twitter, or maybe just like retweeted something that had already been posted by somebody else, and then turned her phone off and got on a plane. Well, by the time she landed in South Africa, and she turned her phone back on, she had like hundreds of missed calls. She found out she was hated by a bunch, like, tens of thousands of people she's never met online, and then she was fired from her job. You know, and so, like, this is just personal. My caution to you in, in using those things. Like, I have a Facebook, but I almost never post anything on it, and I typically use those things for communication, not for thought sharing. Mostly because I think it's not super a super effective medium for a lot of the types of conversations we try to have on it. But I think it also just, it creates so much potential for a, a particular violation of the uh, Bobby Internet. I mean, people may not want to admit it, but if you're gossiping and doing all this false accusations, believe me, people are talking about you too. And you'll get, it's a payback. Yeah, right. Well, they were just talking about that because, uh, was it the, the editor, the new editor they wanted to hire for the Teen Vogue magazine? Um, she had posted something that was anti-Asian when she was 17. And so they, they prevented her hiring. But then it came out that one of the people who prevented her hiring has also posted racist, racist things and I think used the N-word in tweets, right? And so then it just becomes this, this vicious cycle that like crushes everyone, right? Um, somebody over here, there? yeah, Russ. Yeah, I mean, intuitively that you can sort of make the presentation to a group of this age and and we'll hear it but you know the generation of teens and 20 somethings that's grown up online like for them that that is community in a sense so like sure challenges to, to redefine community because you know and we say this all the time almost in jest but for, for that generation if something doesn't happen online it just doesn't happen you know so you sure. can't live your life in public in that sense which is weird because when people live their life in public, they create these mobs against each other. But it's just kind of, you know, it really is a particular challenge to try to to, um, to uphold, you know, thinking well of your neighbor and, and protecting his reputation, particularly when everything's politicized and you only have ever dealt with people in a online context. So right. it's really easy to demonize them. Yeah. And so my, I, I struggle with that sometimes with with just trying to figure out how to how to talk to my kids about the stuff that's happening online has has real meaning and how do you how do you make sure that you're seeing people the way that God sees them when you have only a real cursory relationship with them by seeing what they post and what they choose to post online. Right. Yeah. No, it's, and it's a great point because the the Luddite answer is not for very many people which is Luddite's a term for people who just think technology is bad, and so they don't have any um, 
because we can't get away from it. And it's not all bad, right? Technology is a neutral thing. And in many cases, like right now, we have people trying to have some Bible study otherwise wouldn't be here, right? That's a blessing. So um, that's one of the reasons. Um, and, and for those of you online, Russ was making the point that for a group of this age, it's, that's an easy statement to make. But for those that are like, you know, in their teenage years, most of their interaction, their social interaction is online. That's where a lot of their community is found. So you can't just take it away, which is true. But that's also one of the reasons why, like my primary focus when it comes to like youth and children ministry in the church is actually their parents. Because who are the gatekeepers and the instructors and guides for how to use those things? It's their parents, right? I mean, I'm helping them, but I have a shirt that has a fraction on it that says one over 167. And that's the one average hour a pastor spends with the kids in their congregation versus the equivalent amount of time per hour I spend 167 hours having with mom and dad. So if, if they're only hearing that from me, it's not going to stick, right? Just as if they only practice soccer for an hour a week, they're not going to be good at soccer, right? It's the same here. And so the goal that becomes how you, you teach them how to use those things, just like any other neutral blessing that God gives us, right? Um, and it isn't easy, right? Uh, and there are going to be things that happen online. But that's that's sort of my caution to you, right? My caution isn't don't be on them. My caution is be very careful how you use them. Right? Um, I often wonder, you know, what people are going to feel like when they realize that their entire entire childhood has been pictured and chronicled online for everyone to see, because that's a new thing, right? I don't have a bunch of pictures from when I was two posted all over the internet. But that's the name of the game now. Okay, uh, bottom of the page, the Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. What does that mean? So open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. And this will be the last thing we run out of time. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 14. It's one of my favorite stories. <clears throat> and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of his son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. What does it mean to speak the truth in love? Huh? Tell it like it is. Tell it like it is. 
So yeah, that that phrase always gets me. You are the man. Right? I always, I always definitely feel that being spoken to me. Right. Um, and there's some extra judgment in here that is only is because Nathan is sent as a prophet from God specifically to the king of Israel. That doesn't necessarily apply to everyday situations. But the principle of his message is clear. Right? That part of love is Nathan is loving David here. Our culture would say he's not, but he is. Right? He's coming from God to speak a word of the Lord to David so that David might be saved. And what happens after he says, you are the man, and then outlines why he's been sent to him to speak the word of God. So what does David do? Well, yeah, I mean, he repents here. He repents. I, but I, I have kind of a hard time relating this because, I mean, to, to the, speaking the truth in love, because sure. Nathan is coming from this position of incredible authority on behalf of God, right? And David knows this, right? He knows he's an important prophet. And, um, and, and many of like Saul, you know, Saul repented when he was confronted different times with, by Samuel. But um, isn't that, how, how would we connect that, to, you know, to a neighbor, right? Because they, they don't sure. look up to us as, you know, whether it's like somebody, a friend or. Sure, that's a great question. So it's important to analyze what's happening in this particular story, right? Both people are believers in God. So this isn't something you're going to do to your neighbor who's not a believer in God. Because there's, like we said earlier, there's no expectation for them to even want to follow the rules of God if they don't believe he exists in the first place. So it wouldn't be effective. So there's that. The prophet in the Old Testament, did the prophet in the Old Testament, was he important or had authority on his own? Now, where did his authority come from? From God. And specifically, it's called out in this text that the word of God was the authority here, right? Because the prophet never gave words of their own. They would say, thus says the Lord. And then they would speak. Do you and I have that same authority? Okay. You do if you're saying, thus says the Lord, right? And you're referring to the things that he says, not the things you say, right? And this is, this is part of the radical nature of the new covenant, right? I just mentioned one of those aspects of the sermon today. Like, in order to be in the presence of God, you no longer have to have a rope tied around your waist and only you're allowed once in a year and going backwards, throwing blood over your shoulder so you don't die. Right? Because Jesus was a sacrifice once for all, now you and I have more of an intimate relationship with God than the Old Testament Israelites could have even imagined. We've also been given God's word. And there's a reason we no longer have living prophets sent to us, because God's word is complete and fully satisfied in Jesus. So as long as you're speaking from the authority of Scripture, then you're speaking from God's authority. This is what I'm doing up here. Right? Like the confidence I have in what I'm saying to you is not my own confidence. It's my confidence in God's word. I don't have, I mean, I'm 30, I'm going to be 32 in like three weeks. What do I know about life that people who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s don't already know? Right? That's not why I'm up here. Um, so there's more similarities there than you would think. Now, you're not going to then be able to pronounce those same judgments, of course, because that's not thus says the Lord, especially now in light of Christ, right? But the goal is the same. You're bringing God's word to bear in the presence of sin to bring about repentance from that sin. And even though he's speaking the truth in love, it's not a... a that conversation had to have been pretty awkward. We just have the words. We don't have any of the body language going on. But when Nathan said, you are the man, David was probably stunned and a little bit like, oh, man, he knows. Right? Um, so don't go into a conversation like that expecting it. It's always going to turn out exactly the way you would like, even when you do it correctly. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't wield the word of God in the wrong manner, right? Um, because what's the goal of Nathan coming to David? Is his goal to browbeat David into like crushing his soul? Repentance. It's repentance, right? 
And so, and this is where I really liked, I was, I was in preparation for the sermon today, looking up stuff about the word passion. And its root in Latin is suffer. That's why that was the passion reading today. And we talked about the word compassion. And do you know what that means? To suffer with. To suffer with right? So when you're speaking the truth in love, it's going to be a suffering with moment. Because you don't want to do that. Nathan didn't want to do this. Right? And if you do want to do it, that's your first sign and that you're not ready to say it. Because you're not speaking out of desire for their repentance. You're speaking it from a place where you're like, oh, I got the word of God on my side and I can bludgeon you with it. That's bad. And so then you should stop and wait and repent of that and then come out of come at it the right way. No, Mike, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, one of the things I wanted to point out about this interaction is they had a relationship. Yeah. Right. So I think that's a very key thing. That's a good here. point. They too. had a relationship and that. And, and Nathan, because of that relationship, Nathan knew how to set the stage in a way to make the word effective. Effective, right. Yes. Right. And so I think that's a big thing here. That's a great there's, point. There's a relationship between the two people. Right. Yeah. So not only do they can they both assume that they believe in God, but they have a prior relationship that's that's predefined. Yeah. Right. And so there's an expectation before that even begins. We're about we're about to. Sam, about to unleash the crack. Okay. <laughs> the kids are about to be set free. All right. Can you give them two free donuts? No, he does. Okay. <laughs> Did that Latin about passionum meaning suffering? Did that evolve into our word passion, or is our word passion from a different root? So they have opposite meanings. Well, so the, the secondary meaning, which is primarily associated with passion, develops after the Latin term. Okay. So the and out of it as well. So like passion is, is suffering, which is like an intensive thing. And so that that's thought to be the branch that turned into like zeal and intense passion. Okay. Um came come from that. Yeah. All right, Ron, our last thing, and then we gotta pray and okay. set the kids free. Uh, even though David repented. God still took away his son. Yeah. So I'm not sure if I get that. So that, that part is the, the natural consequence of sin, right? So um, and and there are purely earthly consequences, by the way. None of those are eternal consequences that he prescribes. So like if you damage a relationship you have with someone very close to you because you sin against them, even if you repent of that and are forgiven, there are natural consequences to that in this life. Right. And so the, the judgments that a prophet would speak are those things. So, okay, great discussion as always, um, and great questions. If you have any other things you'd like to discuss with me about that after the class, I'm happy to do that. Um, but let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wondrous gift of your word. The gift of faith we received by the Holy Spirit that has opened our eyes to the truth of this world so that we can have compassion on others who are suffering in the same way that we are, so they may find the same relief and peace and joy that we have found in you. Grant us courage, grant us compassion, and zeal to share the message of the gospel in our relationships, those of the people you have placed in our lives, by displaying the spirit of our community a community that lives in grace, a community that is primary concern is our relationship with God. Help us to always keep that in mind as we interact with others so that by our words and deeds, we may reflect Christ and of your kingdom may grow. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.